Um, well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, everybody can hear me? Yeah. You don't need a mic? Okay. Uh, I come from a country where it's 28 degrees Celsius in the winter time. Uh, so I can't believe anything. <laughs> uh, so this is spring, right? Okay. This is spring. <laughs> this is spring. This yeah, is I believe you. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I'm going to sit down if you don't mind. Um, well, thank you for coming. Uh, I think for an academic uh, session it's not bad. Uh, okay, so what I want to, so I, today I want to talk to you about peer-to-peer, -peer, peer production, uh, and uh, the thesis that there is a new kind of economy being born in the womb of, of capitalism. And it has enough characteristics so that we can actually say uh, that this may be a kind of successor system. Okay, you don't have to believe me, but that's the kind of case I'm going to make uh, in the next. How long do I speak? Uh, usually people speak till you know, about 45, 50 okay. minutes, and then we have the half hour or so. So, like, let me speak for 20 minutes uh, at least, and then if you have questions, you can interrupt me. Uh, but, you know, I think there is a, like a narrative arc that needs to be set uh, in the beginning. So, well, uh, before we start, I'd, I'd like to define a few things. And the first uh, concept we need to define is peer-to-peer -peer itself. Because it's been used in many different ways. Um, as you know, the, the recent historical origin um, it comes from the computer world uh, and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, right? So the idea that uh, we can have systems where computers uh, can connect with each other without any intermediary. So any peer can permissionally connect with any other peer. So that's, that's the original meaning um, of the term peer-to-peer. -peer. It's also used by you know, neoliberal people when they say peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, right? Uh, and there the idea is that every market player can connect with any other market player uh, without uh, intermediaries, which in most cases is not true because you know, they're, they're using these uh, highly centralized proprietary platforms, right? Uh, but, so when we use peer-to-peer -peer in my context, it's, it has a very specific meaning. And to explain this, I use the relational grammar of Alan Page Fisk. Um, it's a very boring book, sociology. <laughs> 800 pages, if I remember, and it... Um, basically says that throughout the world, in all regions, in all time periods, there have always been four uh, typical relationships that people can engage with to deal with resource allocation. Um, um, so the first one, he gives the strange name of equality matching. And basically it's what we usually call the gift economy. So in the gift economy, which was the dominant a way of uh, exchanging resources in the, in the tribal uh, uh, civilization, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the basic idea is I give you something, and paradoxically enough, this creates an inequality between us, because you are now, uh, you got something for me, so I'm kind of superior to you. So the idea is that this creates a social relationship, and therefore the people who gets the gift uh, feel the compulsion to uh, to give the gift back, right, and to restore uh, the the equality in the relationship. And so basically, you know, this is Marcel Mauss and with the gift economy and different descriptions like the potlash uh, uh, festivals and things like that, right? So this is the gift economy. The second one he calls authority ranking. And the most easy way to imagine that is, you know, is the feudal system, right, where uh, if you're born a serf, You'll, you'll have to give 50% of your produce to your lord because he's your lord. He has a higher rank than you. So even the PhD system, he uses the PhD system as, a, as an example of that ranking mechanism, right? You can have a good job, or used to at least, uh, if you had a PhD. Uh, and if you didn't, you, you, know, you couldn't get in, right? So it's, it's based on your rank. What you get is based on your rank. The third one, I don't need to give examples, market pricing, which is basically the dominant relationship in uh, capitalism, where you exchange something that is uh, supposedly of equal value, 
and therefore you don't need to engage in a relationship. You, you just do the transaction and, and you're done, basically. Uh, but there is another one, and he calls it communal shareholding. Uh, communal shareholding, uh, the idea here is that you contribute to a common resource. So in other words, a relationship is not between one individual and another individual, or between a clan and a clan, a family and a family. It's between an individual and some kind of whole, right? So think about um, okay, uh, a small band. In, in um, there's actually an example from Marshall Salen's book. No, no, this comes from Pierre Cluster, uh, Societies Without a State, right? Where he describes all the mechanisms that were used by the, the South American um, native populations to avoid uh, a class society and a state society, and all the mechanisms that they use to to maintain uh, their, their equality. And he gives the example uh, of a small band where the hunters you know, go hunt, they come back with, I don't know, a deer, and as soon as they're back in the tribe, the, there, is a, there is a regulation, there is a mechanism who gets what piece. And actually in most, in most of the cases, the hunter gets the smallest piece. He gets the prestige but it doesn't get... So, in other words, this is not an individual thing, right? They went to hunt on behalf of the tribe or their band. And then when they come back, what they got is not for them as individuals, it's for the whole band, and there's a mechanism of distribution, right? So, in other words, there is a commons, right? So, this is the basic idea of communal shareholding, is that you have a commons, a, uh, a kind of common shared resource that is managed by its user community. So these four mechanisms have always existed, but in different interrelationships, right? You, we could argue, and I would argue, that in different systems, there's a different dominance, right? So in the feudal system, definitely it's authority ranking. That's a, even though you can have maybe an egalitarian you know, community within, within that system, but it's going to be subsumed, it's going to be subordinated to the overall dominance of that authority ranking relationship, right? Similarly, uh, in, in capitalism, we can have a communist family where we share everything, um, uh, but we're still subordinated to the overall dominance of the market uh, mechanism, even if we do that. Um, so, what's the thesis about peer-to-peer -peer is that this kind of relation, relational grammar, the communal shareholding part, right, which has always existed but has always been marginal, is now moving to the core of the system. And the reason for this is that there is a technological affordance which allows us to do that, which when we use it, when we use these internetworks, we can now permissionly, permissionlessly connect with each other, we can self-organize, and we can do this at a global scale. Um, and therefore, uh, as these peer-to-peer -peer networks are you know, spreading throughout society, being used more and more as a structure in different fields, then this kind of dynamic becomes stronger and stronger. Um, and so peer production is a derivative of this fact. What is peer production? It's a, I, I'm not sure we can already say it's a mode of production. I call it a proto-mode of production. So what is peer production? Peer production is a mechanism whereby people uh, throughout the world can contribute to a common resource. So they are contributing. They're contributors. They can only do this because we have open systems, right? Take Microsoft. If you have a problem with Microsoft, you can't solve it because you don't know the code, right? It's privatized, secret code. So there's no way you can yourself contribute to Microsoft, right? But if you have an open system like Linux, an open and transparent system, anybody with a problem and the technical skills can actually start contributing to this common resource, right? Uh, so this is peer production. It's the ability that people have to contribute. And so what they are creating is not a commodity. It's a commons, right? So we have three things here. We have peer production based on open input, 
you have a participatory process, so I call this peer governance, and we have a commons output, peer property. And they are very much connected with each other because um, let's imagine you're a contributor. Um, so as I said, it has to be an open system or you cannot contribute. So this is the first thing. But if you contribute to solve an issue, to solve a particular problem you have, and you do the, you're doing this out of your free will, you're not getting not necessarily getting paid for this, right? If you have a problem with, with your software, you want to solve it, you're gonna do it through your own motivation. You don't need to get paid for it. You have another motivation for doing this. Then of course if Eric tells me, well, you have to do it this way, uh, well, no, why should I, right? You're not, I'm not in a dependency relationship, so I'm not necessarily going to listen to that other person. So in other words, the participatory process goes with the open input and the open contribution. It's a necessary condition for this open input to continue. So this is peer governance. Now, the, the output phase is if we are making a commons, uh, and we have, this com we have this common pool resource, and then uh, somebody says, it's mine, and you slap a patent on it, or a copyright, or you know, some kind of property uh, mechanism, well, who is going to continue to contribute, right? Again, if you want the system to, con to continue within that mechanism of open contributions and participatory pro process, you need mechanisms that are going to maintain the commons over time, or you lose uh, the commons. Uh, a recent example that some of you <coughs> know, uh, uh, 3D printing, uh, the patents were liberated uh, in 2014, and a bit before as well. Uh, so suddenly now, the 3, 3D printing designs are in the public domain, and they're actually an open resource, right? Uh, so people started making something called the MakerBot which was the first uh, affordable open uh, 3D printer. Uh, some of the people involved in the project thought, well, you know, we need to grow, so we need funding, and they went to venture capital. Right? So what does venture capital do? Well, we're not going to put our money into this uh, thing if, you know, if our competitor can share it and, and take it. So the pressure of the venture capital meant that the MakerBot 2 was not an open uh, system anymore. So what happens? Well, what happens is that all the people stop contributing to MakerBot 2, and they fork, and they continue to make open source MakerBots, right? So for the company, it might be a clever thing in the short term to say we're going to appropriate, appropriate this, right? It's, it's a classic move, we're going to appropriate it. But here's a situation, and this is an important argument, to show why even in capitalism, peer production is such an interesting phenomenon. If I succeed in enclosing this particular common resource, and with my venture capital, I'm able to hire 40 engineers, great. But what about the rest? Well, the rest is an ecosystem with 15 companies and 4,000 engineers, right? So even from the point of view of capitalist self-interest, the, uh, the motivation n not to enclose is very strong, right? So actually, uh, you know, I would call this asymmetric uh, competition, and I would argue that we're, we're, when, whenever in an in industrial sector you have the emergence of this open ecosystem, it will tend to displace the older proprietary form, right? We've seen this with encyclopedias. We've seen this with free software. We've seen this now with 3D printing. We're seeing this in many, many new sectors. We see this gradual displacement of a proprietary form of capitalism to some kind of adaptation between capitalism and peer production, right? Uh, so why is this interesting? Well, because historically, if you look at phase transitions, right, the reason we have capitalism, it, 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 it's because it grew within feudalism, right? The early capitalist merchants and investors solved a number of issues which a declining feudal system had. And this is why it could grow within the old system. 
uh, eventually would become an organic system itself and then replace the old system. Same thing if you look at the end of the Roman Empire, uh, it can no longer expand, so there's no more gold, there's no more slaves, um, there's no more taxation. Uh, what, so what happens in that case? Well, uh, slaves are fleeing, the barbarians are coming. It makes sense to liberate, quote unquote, your slaves and to put, make them into serfs, right? Instead of 1,000 legionnaires, you need 100. Instead of 100% of their production, you get 50% but it makes sense within the declining uh, older system to move to that new system, right? So here's the, ar the central argument is that uh, today we have this interconnection, this codependency between capitalism and peer production. Peer production needs capitalism because of the investments in peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, because of the wages they pay us. And the other, on the other hand, Increasingly, capitalism needs peer production, needs these open resources, needs that knowledge in order to uh, cut down its cost, access free labor, and, and innovate, and many, many other factors, right? So there is, at this moment, this codependency. Okay, I want to make, give you a few examples to show you how, how different peer production is from a classic capitalist system, from the, the logic of, of capitalism. So I already told you that it's based on contributions, not labor, and it produces a commons and other commodities. This is already, right? These are already two factors that you do not find in a classic capitalist enterprise, where you have labor, itself a commodity, that produces other commodities. Um, so I'll give you a few keywords and explain them just to show you how different it is. Well, first of all, Peer production is no longer based on a division of labor, it's based on a distribution of tasks, right? Think, think about the Wikipedia, for example. So think, of, think about the Wikipedia as a giant uh, football game, right? If you play football, I'm, I'm, I'm European, so I mean soccer, actually, right? Uh, so if you play soccer, right, you oversee the whole field, right? There's a transparency in the game. You can see all your teammates, and you can see the other team, right? So that allows the teams that play with each other to, to adapt their behavior to the game in real time, all the time, right? Okay, maybe at 40, after 45 minutes they may have a little conclave, but basically the whole game, you know, they, you don't talk to each other, right? You, so this is called stick merging, right? It's signaling language. So think about the ants and the bees and the social insects that they don't get orders from their queen, they get chemical information from their peers, basically, right? Go left, go right, go up, go down, whatever it is that they do with each other. Uh, it's based on this signaling uh, mechanism, right? So think about the Wikipedia and Linux and uh, open design communities as giant stick merging systems, right? This is quite extraordinary that we can now coordinate extraordinary complex um, social artifacts at a global scale without command and control hierarchy and without the market mechanism, right? Through social al allocation, free social allocation of human effort. Um, and it's not I have a job and I'm doing this, no. It's something needs to be done. I have the skills to do it and the time and the willingness, so I'm going to adhere my skill and my time to this particular task that needs to be performed, right? So think about, um, okay, uh, you, you're an expert in Theravada Buddhism, you go and check the Wikipedia and there is no article, right? What does it tell you? It tells you, you can write it. This is the signal, right? And because it's an open system, you can do it. If, you, if there is an article and there is a mistake, then the signal is there is a mistake and you can correct it. So this is what we mean with stigma G. But it's very important that we can now do this. This is new. Now, if you think about motivation, uh, the motivation aspect is also very interesting. Um, I call this the third revolution in human productivity. The first one is, of course, the invention of coercion, right? Um, civilization, 
as we know it is the result of forced labor. Um, so uh, before we worked three or four hours a day, according to um, um, solids, right? Uh, so with slavery, with serfdom, uh, we have an enormous revolution in human productivity. But it's based on coercion, right? It means if there is no coercion, there is no work. Is there is, there is no uh, uh, you call it contremaître? Uh, nobody works, right? This is the, the great weakness of such a system. So you could argue that capitalism um, is the second revolution in human productivity, right? Instead of external negative motivation, fear, it introduces external positive motivation, greed, or mutual interest, right? So here we have a system that motivates people not exclusively through force, but uh, through necessity, like I need, I, I, I am labor, I don't have something to eat, I need to work, I'm going to exchange in, in exchange for money, right? I don't need to be beaten up to work. It's my own necessity that that motivates me to exchange, because we know how it works in reality, but that's nevertheless a big change from, from a system that's exclusively based on folks, right? Um, and of course, we, we, we know that capitalism was indeed a, a highly productive system. Uh, but what's the problem with capitalism? Well, if there is no money, nothing to exchange, there is no work either, right? So you always need that exchange to take place. So if we have an economic crisis, there's no money, there's no work, and nothing gets produced. Think now about the Wikipedia in that context. Uh, it's not a, the best example, because we actually have examples like Linux, where 75% of people are paid. Right? So I take Wikipedia as a kind of extreme example. But in the Wikipedia, how many people are coerced to work? I cannot imagine there are Wikipedia slaves. Maybe there are. Uh, I don't think so, right? I haven't seen any sign of it yet. Uh, how many people are paid to produce Wikipedia? Very few. A few at the CIA, a few there from Microsoft, you know, a few PR companies. But it's marginal, right? Most people who are working for the Wikipedia are working there on their own volition. This is a revolution. This is a third revolution in human productivity, that we have now systems that allow people to self-allocate their effort to intrinsic positive motivation. I can tell you, this is the dream of any HR manager, right? Mm -hmm. This is what they want. And they don't get it, right? In, in, in today, is it one out of five people who still work in particular places they wouldn't get paid? And I guess that's an optimistic uh, estimate. Uh, but that's a general rule, right? Very few people today have the job that they want. So they are working because they have this exchange. They're not working out of, out of an intrinsic motivation. So if we can imagine that we have a system that would have this as a core, right? Where you have passionate people choosing their own activity, uh, you can easily, say, e easily see why that would work. So you can easily see why the Wikipedia, without coercion and without money, could outcompete, to use a capitalist term here, or outcooperate, if you like, the classic proprietary encyclopedias, right? We can easily see why, why every million dollar of free software is destroying $64 million of proprietary software. Uh, we can see why uh, in the new industrial sectors, like the ones that work with 3D, 3D printing, open design is becoming almost a standard operating way of practice. Um, again, if, if you look at it from the individual point of view, from a company, you can have a choice now between working with 40 people, competing against everybody else, or you have a choice of joining an ecosystem with 4,000 people who are collectively developing a resource, right? And this is actually what is happening uh, today. Um, Anti-credentialism, I think this is another interesting uh, uh, characteristic of uh, peer production. Um, here we are in a credentialist system, right? So if we look at history, we had the medieval systems where uh, knowledge was uh, embedded in communities and was, it wasn't shared outside, right? If you were a guild member, 
one of the conditions of your membership was not to divulge your specialized knowledge. Uh, in the church, they weren't particularly happy when Luther started translating the Bible and sharing it uh, with other people, right? So the bourgeois modernity revolution, if you like, was an idea of let's spread the knowledge, right? Did the road, the encyclopedia. It was about spreading that knowledge to everyone. But then it built a quality control system. It was credentials, right? You can't be a journalist without being hired by a newspaper. You can't write an academic book if you don't have a PhD, etc., etc. Right? We have credentialist systems. So the, the quality control is up front. It works different way in these peer production communities. The, the quality control is after the fact, right? So anybody can contribute, but there's always a system that, that defends the integrity and the quality of the production. Right? So you have maintainers in Linux, you have editors in Wikipedia, and these are people who do not tell people what to do, but they control the quality of the work. They can say no when it's done. So in other words, a maintainer in Linux can say, I don't want this patch, it's not good enough, or it, it doesn't follow a certain logic, right? But there's, but there's, so there's a control hierarchy in peer production, but there's no command hierarchy. This is also an important innovation. Okay, so, um, peer production already has a uh, emerging institutional structure. And it consists of three different players. The first one is the community, a community of contributors that, that functions through self-allocation of effort. The second uh, is what I call the entrepreneurial coalition, right? So when a peer production project is successful, so it usually starts with volunteers. You know, just people basically like uh, Linus Torvalds who says, we need an alternative to Microsoft. Or Richard Stallman who says, you know, we need free software so that we can continue to work on it. Um, so it always starts with one or more people who decide to construct a social object, to, to make something together. Um, and it, it, of course, you can imagine, I think Dickens said something uh, similar, so I'm going to paraphrase him. All the people can volunteer some of the time. Some of the people can volunteer all of the time. But not all of the people can volunteer all of the time, right? So, why? So, in other words, if you don't build an economy around peer production, it's not going to last, right? Um, so you need uh, you need an economy around it. You need livelihood. You need to create livelihoods in order to continue this kind of passion production over time. So what we see is that when peer production uh, projects are successful, they create an economy around that community, right? So around Linux, we have a Linux economy. Around Drupal, there's a Drupal economy. There's, Wikipedia is a bit different. But many, many, many open source projects, free open knowledge, open software, and open design, create their economic system. Now, how, how big do you think this is? Uh, well, there's a report called the Fair Use Economy in the US, one sixth of GDP, 70 million workers today work around shared knowledge. Now, it's not all peer production. It can be, for example, you know, geographical information, used to be public, right? And the NNO, the NOAA gives it to the public domain, and so it creates an economy around this shared geographical knowledge that wasn't peer produced originally, right? But has become, in a way, a commons. And that then generates an economy of geo-applications, geolocation, and all that. So that's already one sixth of GDP in the US. So it's not a small, a small thing. Um, so the third institution is so community, <coughs> entrepreneurial coalition, and the third institution is the Floss Foundations, or I call them four benefit institutions. So what do they do? What does the Wikimedia Foundation do? What does the Linux Foundation do? What does the GNOME Foundation do? The Drupal Foundation, the Bitcoin Foundation? They do not command and control the production. So this is maybe important to understand as well. Take a classic NGO. What is the worldview of a classic NGO? There is a problem. In order to solve that problem, we need resources. So 
So we're going to collect those resources and we're going to direct the efforts to solve that issue, right? So it's a scarcity orientation, right? There's a problem, there's scarce resource, we're going to direct the scarce resources to that problem. This is not how it works in peer production. There is a problem. There are enough people in the world with the skills and the willingness to solve that problem. So let's make a platform that allows people to allocate their effort to solve that problem. <coughs> right? So these for benefit associations do not command and control the effort, but they enable and empower the, contribu the contributory system to operate. Think about Wikipedia, if you don't have servers, it wouldn't work, right? So somebody needs to pay for the service, that's the Wiki, Wikimedia Foundation. The Linux Foundation may, for example, organize certification, organize the conferences. Uh, so there's a lot of things to do, <coughs> even in a contributory system, to, that, that, to allow it to continue to work. And this is the role of these four benefit associations. Now just to uh, give you an idea, because that maybe we'll discuss uh, tomorrow, is it's very easy for me at, la at least to, to go from the micro logic of this emergent uh, system to a macro logic, right? So let's imagine that, it's, that you're not talking about making software, but you have a society. So I'm arguing that this emerging model of peer production is also an emerging social model. So let's imagine the following. We have a society where civil society is the core. Civil society has become productive, right? So in the old system we think private persons, labor and capital, create value. That value is captured and redistributed by corporations. Because in the market, we don't look at externalities, we need a state to discipline and regulate the market. So this is the basic idea, right? Civil society, we don't even talk about. We say non-profits is derivative, and we say non-governmental, it's also derivative, right? So in our current system, civil society is not seen as productive. It's what you do after you come home tired, basically, right? In peer production, in a peer-to-peer -peer society, what we, we would conclude is no, civic society is productive because they are the contributors to the common resources. So we have a society where citizens contribute freely to the commons of their choice. And because they do that, we have a productive civil society. These citizens need to make a living, so they're part of, of these ethical entrepreneurial coalitions that will work around the commons and create livelihoods for the commons. And these FLOS foundations, uh, FLOSS means free, liberal, open source software, these for benefit associations, if you look them at the state level, they're a partner state. They enable and empower the autonomous social production. Right? So you can see how you can go from the micro analysis to a, a macro analysis to say this is actually a working system, a working post-capitalist system. Um, now, I want to briefly say how it's related to other related um, uh, phenomena. Uh, think about the sharing economy, think about crowdsourcing, think about all these related uh, emergencies. So, how is it related to peer production? Well, today peer production is basically the mutualization of knowledge, right? This is what is sharing knowledge, sharing immaterial resources, because they can work today as a company. The sharing economy, collaborative consumption, they are the mutualization of physical resources, right? Uh, so this is the link between the two. And what links both of them is distributed infrastructures, right? The, the technological affordance that now allows us to share skills, uh, cars, bikes, you know, all of these things we can do in the physical world are also dependent on, on the same type of technology. And there is a linkage between the two. Um, and, uh, okay, so let me show you something that kind of shows how 
control how the leads. Yes, I, I want to do it. Thank you. Here. Can you see that? Right. Yeah. So this is a uh, an attempt to show how <coughs> deep production is embedded in the political economy of capital, right? So the vertical axis divides centralized versus decentralized <coughs> control, and the horizontal axis divides the get the goal of the activity. Is it, is it for benefit or for profit? So it gives us four gradients. Um, so let's take the, the, this one here. So we have centralized control with a for-profit aim of peer-to-peer -peer infrastructures and dynamics, right? Sounds a bit contradictory, centralized control of this view, right? But think about Facebook, which is a quintessential example, right? Facebook allows two billion people to permissionlessly connect with each other, to self-organize, to organize revolution, to look for lost cats, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, right? Whatever you want to do with Facebook, uh, we can do it. Uh, but this is only the front end, right? The front end allows peer-to-peer -peer relationships, but the back end is proprietary, is centralized, they capture our data and they sell our data. Uh, so it, and it's a totally centralized system, right? So this is what I call netarchical capitalism, right? The hierarchy of the network, right? The, the higher the hierarchs of the net. And you can also see why this is a very problematic uh, solution. Uh, think about use value and exchange value here. In terms of use value, it's not a bad deal at all, right? Because you know we can use it for free, right? So thank you, Facebook, for investing all those billions so that we can share cat pictures <laughs> and other stuff, right? Um, so it's, it looks like a good deal, and that's why we use it. Because on, in terms of use value, it seems like a fair exchange. Now, if you look at the exchange value, it's a different story, right? The story is that a platform that would be empty would have zero value. So I think we can say with some confidence that without us exchanging, it, you know, there would be no value at all. But then the, the exchange value, which is basically selling our attention, that's the business model, right? Selling our attention to advertisers is really the basic way in which they, they make money. How much do we get from that exchange value? And the answer is nothing, or as far as I know, not many, I don't know of any use actually getting money from Facebook, right? So this is a problem. Because what I would argue, um, is this a faceable? I hope so. Okay. So this is what I would argue, um, that we have a exponential growth in our capacity to create use value by ourselves, right? Think about YouTube, think about all these platforms. You know, a, a record company would produce records, right? Uh, a media company would produce movies and series, but what does YouTube do? It doesn't produce anything, right? It allows us to produce and exchange what, what we've done. Also illegal things that other people have produced. Uh, Google doesn't produce documents, right? It allows us to exchange documents. Uh, so in other words, well, they, they enable use value creation, right? Which is rising exponentially. There's more and more stuff we can do. Monetization is only growing linearly. And as I argued there, it's not being shared at all. But so this is the problem here. This is the gap, right? The increasing gap between our capacity to create use value and the capacity to create livelihoods through monetary exchange. So this is what I call the value crisis, right? So in that context, the capture of peer production by capital 
creates a value crisis, right? It's hyper neoliberal, neoliberal neoliberalism. If you define neoliberalism as you know, the historical break in the 80s in which the rise in productivity of the workers was no, was no longer shared, but captured by financial capital, right? So there's no longer, the more productive we get today, the, the wages stay the same, right? And all the money is captured by the financial system. Then we had the credit uh, boom, uh, so we don't get paid, we, we can borrow money, and now we can't pay it back. So this is the uh, this general mechanism of neoliberalism. But now we have, you know, it's even worse. We can work for free as much as we like, and we're not getting paid, right? So you can see that this is like a parasitical system, right? But you could make the same argument for Uber, Airbnb, why, why can they make super profits? Hotels have to produce buildings, right? Taxi drivers have to buy their car. But these new systems, they just take what we already have, right? And they just make the linkages. They use peer-to-peer -to, -peer to allow us to make linkages between supply and demand, but they're no longer producing, just as these companies are no longer producing, right? Um, so, this is a problem for us because it increases precarity. It's also a problem for capital, right? Because if there's no capital accumulation, if, I mean, if you can't sell it, you, you have a problem, right? So, so the nightmare vision of the extreme here is that we have, are moving to a, ca a capital system which is no longer paying uh, and therefore cannot sell what it produces. And this is a problem for everyone, right? So peer production, which has, in my view, lots of advantages, also, it's very problematic in this sense, right? This is a classic, in my view, Marxist contradiction between the mode of production and the relations of production, right? It creates an increasing contradiction in that sphere. Okay, here is another way we can, we, we, we can do it. This is the dream of the anarcho-capitalists. Um, and basically, the idea is everybody can be a market player, right? Everybody. Let's democratize the ability to be market players. So if you look at Bitcoin, it's called a peer-to-peer -peer currency. And again, the way it is, every computer can generate the coins, right? But it's also designed in a certain way. The way it's designed is that in the beginning, it's very easy to make coins. And the longer it goes, the more difficult it is to produce the coins. Um, which creates a deflationary logic. So in other words, the, the, it's designed so that supply, out, the demand will always outgrow the supply, right? So in other words, it creates a rent extracting mechanism, right? If you win early, then you can sell your Bitcoins to the people who come later. And without doing any effort, you make money. It's, it's, a, it's, a, rent, it's a rent extraction mechanism, right? Um, and this is, of course, using peer-to-peer -to, -peer to commodify everything. This is the basic idea, right? So this is a bit different from this vision, but it's still designed because of greed, self-interest, right? This works, people get Bitcoin because they think that the value of Bitcoin is going up, basically, right? Now, there are also here two alternative uh, mechanisms that are being born at the same time. Here I use local versus global rather than distributed versus centralized. We have today an extraordinary explosion of civic initiatives. Uh, I don't know the figures in the US, but I read, for example, that in two years' time, urban agriculture augmented with 48%. It's extraordinary, right? 48% growth in the production of urban agriculture, which is mostly done um, by you know, local communities, it's growing like hell. There is a Dutch statistic that I saw a week ago. It's from a document called Homo Cooperance from a Belgium um, commons researcher. And she noted, so she, she looked at the number of cooperatives and civic, organized civic initiatives since the 80s. And you know, it's basically very slow growth. And then in 2005, it goes exponential, right? In other words, before the crisis. This is not a reaction to the crisis. But since 2005, 
whether you talk about energy cooperatives, local food production, uh, local car sharing and bike sharing initiatives, all these things are exploding. And I'm pretty sure this is the case in the US as well. And this is also has to do with technology, right? I'll give you the example with bike sharing. Um, in Amsterdam, they tried it since the 60s, right? It was called the white bikes. And every seven years, they would try it again. And every seven years, it would fail. Very easy, white bikes, people would steal it. And then after a while, you know, the, the, they said, okay, we stop, right? Today, it's very easy. You put a geolocation chip in a bike. And if they steal it, you know where it is. So people don't steal it anymore. So, you know, technology is important, right? You cannot just ignore it. It's a very important factor. I would argue, generally speaking, that the coordination, transaction, and combination costs have gone so low today because of technology that we can make different choices more easily, right? So the choice of sharing is not easier than the choice of privatizing. And this is how, so this is, this is really creating uh, an enormous dynamism at the local level where people, and in my view it's also peer production, they are thinking about how do we change the food supply chain, how do we change the energy supply chain, how do we change education, and, and many, many things. So think about Germany, right, where today 60% um, of the energy is produced by energy corporate. So this is not, you know, not a marginal development. Now, the last one is here, and this is a bit, in my view, lacking, and this is where basically my work is, is centered around, is the whole idea of that we, you know, because of questions of power, we should be working at the same level as the enemy. So in other words, uh, if we ever want to change global structures, we can just be happy with local initiatives. We need global uh, organizations, global institutions, global collective action institutions. Um, and, okay, I'm going to make a little historical argument here why, why this is so important. Um, at the end of the Roman Empire, it was a classic resource crisis, in a way, right? Uh, so, in other words, the, the cost of expansion was getting higher than the cost, than the benefits of expansion. So after a while, it stops expanding. No more gold, no more slaves, no more money to, to pay the legionnaires. You have to tax the farmers more and more internally. So all these things were going wrong. So what is the answer? What happened at the end of the Roman Empire? Well, with a bit of a stretch, but I don't like to do it. What was the global open design community? It was the Catholic Church, right? The monks, right? So they, they neutralized knowledge. Uh, there is a book by Jean Gimple, The First Medieval Industrial Revolution. 90% of innovations came from the monks. In agriculture, in industry, it came from the, the monks were traveling throughout Europe, creating a unified cultural sphere, and were exchanging all these innovations uh, throughout the continent. Mutualization of resources. Again, the monasteries, right? People uh, diminish their uh, needs on a, by collectivizing some of the, uh, uh, the provisioning systems, and, this, uh, and then relocalization, right? So open source today is the same, right? We have an impending resource crisis. What do we do? We are mutualizing our knowledge, the emergence of open source. We are mutualizing our infrastructures, the emergence of the sharing economy, and we are relocalizing. And this is where it becomes inter interesting. Peer-to-peer -peer production allows us to think entirely differently about production, right? I read a study, um, okay, I, I, I use this as a typical industrial object. I'm thirsty as well, just a moment. So, uh, in the 1980s, a lady called Margaret Kennedy calculated already then that 48% of the price we pay is rent. Right? So the, all the money we borrow and the rent we pay on that money is 48% of everything you buy today. 
So if you, you, you would have a rent-free money creation system, you could diminish this by half, the cost of production. That's one thing. Another study shows that three quarters of production today is transportation. So you know, if you look at material and energy flows, it costs three times more to get stuff to you than it is to actually produce it, right? Okay, so third, intellectual property. Of course, probably very low here. But think about medicines, think about many things. You know, you're talking about 3,000, 4,000, sometimes 30,000 percent profit rates on top of the cost of actually producing something because of the intellectual property, right? So imagine you have a system that doesn't have that. Um, which is why, and this is shown in different studies, the cost of open hardware is about one-eighth of the cost of proprietary hardware. So in other words, you could do this in university, by the way. If you take your science labs and you systematically change from proprietary instruments to open instruments, so you have open calorimeters, open colorimeters, open microscopes, everything. And you buy the book Open Source Lab from Joshua Pierce to do it. It's, a, it's like a roadmap. You can save 80% of your cost for having a scientific lab laboratory. In Ecuador, we were working with an indigenous community, and the situation is very easy. They, they're isolated in the volcano area, they don't have a direct con connection to the market, and the buyers tell them every year, well, sorry, we can't pay you as much as last year because the Colombians are cheaper than you. And um, so, of course, they have the subsistence economy, you know, and they have food, but they don't have anything else, right? So they can't send their kids to school, there's no surplus, uh, and they're getting poorer every year. So what could you do? Well, what you could do is, is for example, work with these guys here. Um, so this is a typical peer-to-peer -peer project where scientists, citizen scientists, and farmers throughout the world are sharing and, and collectivizing their research, right? So they, for example, people in Bhutan and people in Peru with similar uh, gradients on their in, you know, biotopes and stuff, collaborate on experimenting with seeds and stuff and sharing the knowledge, right? So this, they enhance their productivity by doing this. And this is totally outside the system of the state and capital. These are, this is peer-produced science, right? Now you can also do this with machines. So one of the projects we had was on open agricultural machining. We have today global open design communities like Farm Hack in the US, Atelier Paysan in France, and there are many of them, Slow Tools Project. These people are sharing their designs of agricultural machinery. Now the people who live in these mountains in Ecuador don't have access to machinery. And even if they would, they can't pay it. And even if they would have the money, it would force them to abandon their lives, their, their social structures, right? So the only way for them is if we can connect these global open design communities, which includes farmers in the same biotopes in different areas of the world, they could develop their own machinery locally, right? So this brings me to my, my point. We can adopt a principle today What's light is global, and what's heavy is local, right? So if we bring all these things together, all these elements together, we can have, imagine an economic system where the knowledge is shared. There's no artificial scarcity at the level of knowledge, right? Everything invented anywhere in the world is available for any, anyone in, in the world, basically. So global open communities of engineers, of architects, of scientists, whatever, are collaborating in creating technical and scientific knowledge. But the production, because of 3D printing and distributed machinery and distributed capital like crowdfunding, social lending, and all these things, allow us to create micro factories at the local level and to produce on demand and not supply driven, right? So if you think about the Middle Ages, for example, right? It was, an, it was a demand-driven economy. It wasn't a supply-driven economy. In capitalism, we have a supply-driven economy. We need centralization, we need a lot of money, 
we, so we produce a surplus, so we need to sell it, we need marketing, we create artificial needs all the time, right? We can imagine a wholly different system where we, we produce a lot of things locally. And I'll give you one example, which most of you should know by now, like the Wikispeed car. 80 people in a dozen countries in three months without any capital produce a car that is road ready, certified, that is five times as fuel efficient as any car produced by Detroit. And they're saying we can't do it, right? They say we can't do this. It's not, it's impossible. But they've done it. So it's today it's possible technically that you would have a micro factory in Madison that would produce cars or agricultural machinery on demand through a series of micro factories. So I'm not saying it's gonna to happen tomorrow, but technically this is now totally in the cards, right? And it's it's starting to happen as well. Um, how much time do I have left? Well, it's 10 after 5. Yeah, so and we go to stop long, at 5.30. Right? Okay. So, so I'm going to just kind of uh, conclude then with the, the problem and some of the things the way we see it. So my aim is, and people like me and the people I work with, is how can we make peer production autonomous? How can we make it into a real organic system that can self-reproduce itself, right? And now this is the problem. I am a commoner, I'm a peer producer, I contribute to a shared resource. But if I want to make a living, I need to be labor for capital. Or I need to be a freelancer, so instead of a slave to my boss, I'm a slave to the market. It's the same thing, <coughs> I'm experiencing this. Uh, anyway, so, so this is the issue, right? We, ha we have commons accumulation today, this is new. Because historically, capitalism was always against the commons, it always enclosed the commons. Now we have IBM investing in the commons. This is new. But the issue is that I, as a commoner, I cannot self I cannot create my own livelihood without becoming labor for capital. So in other words, we have commons accumulation, but we also have capital accumulation. And they are codependent on each other. How can we break this? Well, here's a few ideas. Um, okay, the first idea is we're working on a new license. So, here, so today, the open source economy works with sharing licenses. The general public license, creative commons, stuff like this. But here's a paradox. The more communistic the license, the more capitalistic the practice. Right? If you say everybody can share, then IBM can share Linux. Right? So the paradox is that these sharing licenses create commons production, which is totally embedded in the political economy of capital. So we propose something else which is called copy fair instead of copy left. Actually, we used to call it copy far left, but that didn't work very well. So copy fair is the following idea. Every common good institution can use our commons. Every non-commercial activity can use our commons. Every for-profit that contributes to our commons can use our commons. But for profits that do not contribute to our commons, need to pay a license fee. Now, the idea here is not to, it's not about the money. It's actually about reintroducing the principle of reciprocity in the market sphere, right? Because typically, the, the, the defining feature of a capitalist market economy is that it doesn't care about externalities. We care about our own transaction. And we need the state to regulate and impose on us, you know, a care for externalities, right? But if we, ha if we have this in our, in our license, we can introduce externalities structurally in the, in the ethical market coalition around the particular common. So this is the basic idea with the copy fair license. I can explain more, but I'm, I'm, then we don't have time to discuss. Second thing, this is what we call open cooperatives. So basically what we want to do is to create between the sphere of commons accumulation and capital accumulation, a sphere of cooperative accumulation. So here, we, an open cooperative is a co-op that is common good oriented, that has multi-stakeholder governance. They already exist, it's called solidarity co-ops. They're the dominant form of co-ops in Quebec and Northern Italy. But we add two things. They have to produce commons, and they have to be global in orientation. 
So what does it mean to produce commons? Immaterial commons would mean that if you produce knowledge, design, and software, you share it. But you can also produce material commons. I'll give you an example. There is a housing co-op in Quito called Alianza Solidaria. And they, they make houses for the very poor. So if you want to enter the co-op, you need a little bit of money. You need to work 100 hours. So what do they do with these 100 hours? They clean the ravines because Quito is full of ravines and people you know, uh, throw their, their, their waste in, in the ravines, so it's horrible. So they clean the ravines and make them into public parks, which is available for everybody. In other words, this co op creates a commons, right? So this is the, 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 the so by doing this, what we obtain is a situation where I'm a commoner, I contribute to a commons, but I'm also creating a livelihood within a co-op that co-produces that same commons, right? Um, okay, third one, and this is something we will talk about next week, contributory accounting. Think about the Huffington Post as an example. Uh, so we have here a citizen journalist uh, platform where people for three years write for free. And then Mrs. Huffington, which is a very nice leftist lady, sells it, and she gets what? Was it $360 million or $600 million? And how much do the journalists get? Zero. So this is not fair, right? This is the problem with contributory uh, system. If you do things for free, and then there is some, something goes to the market that he captures the whole the value that is being collectively created. And it's not fair. So contributory accounting is a mechanism which allows us to measure contributions without necessarily directly linking it to the market, but when something is created in the market, a part of the revenue goes to the common effort. So we do this in the P2P Foundation. We have a, a translator co-op co called Guerrilla Translation. And they do a lot of pro bono translation. They translate commons oriented text from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. And they take note of this. It's not for pay. Now, if some of them get a job, and they do, and they get paid to translate a book. The fact that they did get that contract is because 20 people created collectively the social capital of this, uh, of this cooperative, right? So 20% of the income is, is given to the, the open accounting system. So this is called contributory income. There's many variations on this. So I just, I'm just showing you that you know, this is a real economy with real people facing problems and finding solutions for problems and, and then fighting to get these solutions implemented, implemented, right? And if we succeed in this, <coughs> then we can move from a proto-mode of production, which is not yet able to self-reproduce, to a, a fully operational organic system that can self-reproduce itself. This is how capitalism became dominant, right? If you remember, the, the origin of the capital, well, there's many different ways, but one of the examples we can use is the putting out system. So the people in the guilds originally were doing everything themselves. They had their machines, they would sell it to the market. At some point, the machines became too expensive. So you had, you know, the early uh, owners of capital would rent out the machines to the workers but the works were still independent, right? So in other words, in, in this situation, capital was subsumed under, under the old system. It wasn't able to fully reproduce itself without using the guilds and the guild system to, for its own benefit, right? Then at some point, the guilds collapsed, were destroyed, and people had to sell their labor. Labor became a commodity. At that moment, capitalism was the dominant system that could fully reproduce itself and become bigger and bigger, right? So this is the same that we aim for with bee production, is moving from this emergent phase where we're not able to fully socially reproduce ourselves to a, to a situation where we can. And once we achieve this, uh, then all the gains, the hyper-productive gains of this new system become available for the alternative subsystem, which can then become a dominant system. Okay, this is my dream. It's not reality today, uh, but... Um, I'm a pathological optimist, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll end this way. Okay, so look, we only have 10 minutes for discussion today. Sorry for that. But there's yeah. a second 
we have, just to remind everyone, we have a second presentation tomorrow, which I will discipline you more so that you will have more time. So there'll be discussion a little bit today, more discussion tomorrow, and then on Thursday from 12.20 till 2, just an open free-for-all discussion for anybody who wants to pursue any themes that come out of these two lectures. So now we have 10 minutes, so uh, I'll uh, call on people, who want, anyone who wants to raise an issue and begin our extended conversation. Yeah. Yes, there are some severe differences in the level of participation uh, uh, in terms of gender and in terms of some racial vari uh, uh, variables, in terms of, uh, of uh, let's say, Wikipedia, uh, many of the open source software systems and all that. Uh, what do, are you bothered at all by these variations? I, have you looked at some of the systems that are meant to ameliorate some of those uh, variations? Uh, for example, there are Wikipedia uh, uh, parties where women get together to uh, uh, write about uh, uh, women figures, famous women in history, who might have been left out of the Wikipedia. Um, it, it's a problem. It, de it depends on the field. Like, you know, in social media, women are actually more stronger. But certainly the free software world is very male-dominated. In the P2P Foundation, we, we also have <laughs> more males than females. Um, so, you know, a commons operates uh, for a social object, right? It, 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 it can't solve all the issues that are around it. You know, it's like asking schools to solve all the problems that are created by the society in which it lives. So I'm not saying we should do this, but you know, it's difficult. Because there's a number of things, like for example, in free software, you know, the number of women who study technology is much lower than the number of men. So you have but I would, I would think that the most issues there are mostly cultural. Wikipedia, so, though, is pretty shocking. I, I don't yeah. know what the exact statistics are. It's something like 84% men versus you know, 16, it's, something it's like mo that. I think it's mostly cultural because there's really nobody saying Wikipedia, you can't come in as a female. You know, either they don't come in, or when they come in, maybe they don't like the culture, which is a critique that is often formulated by, by women, is that you know, these cultures are very male-oriented, are somewhat aggressive, um, and so what is happening is, you know, that women are organizing basically within these uh, communities. There, there's all kinds of cyber chicks and net girls and, you know, Linux woman circles. Though. So, uh, you know, it's, you have to, you, you, if you are disadvantaged, you have to do something about it yourself as well, not just wait for the, uh, the dominant culture to, to change. Um, uh, and I also think you know we need to work outside of the commons because the commons is also selfish, right? If you're a Linux programmer, you don't care about climate change. You care about Linux, right? If you make 3D printing, maybe all you want to do is making little soldiers, toy soldiers. So, so the, the commons, you know, they they are they are motivated by their own social subject. They are not necessarily motivated by other things. I have a question about the sort of the tendency of where the P2P culture is going. It seems like um, P2P cultures, as you just uh, mentioned, are interest driven. And do you see a time, sort of, uh, when what people do for a living will be separated from how they get paid for their work? Like, do you see sort of like a future of state provided standard of living and then people working on interest? Is that a possible future that you're yeah, thinking about? Yes, uh, I mean, Everybody in peer production creates a basic income, right? But whether it's realistic is, of course, another issue. But if you look at the evolution of technology, now the ability now, you know, like the algorithms, the self-driving cars, I mean, a lot of intellectual jobs, right, are in danger today in the way that they were before. So the idea of having a basic income becomes <coughs> more and more interesting. Uh, now, personally, because I'm, I still don't believe that it's realistic at this stage, um, I argue for a transition income. Slightly different transition income is that the government, as a part of state, would say, well, a number of things are clearly not being worked on by the market, and a state-driven centralized solution may not be the best option. So let's create conditions so that people who want to work on, let's say, organic food systems and non-toxic agriculture 
that they can do this, right? And so you identify social priorities and you start funding those social priorities and by creating a basic income for those people. So that's something that I would like to see. There's a, a French philosopher, and Bernard Stiegler, for me the only philosopher who understands B2B, uh, he talks about a contributed income. I, I still don't know exactly what he means by it, but so people are thinking in that direction, yes. Uh, and the way, to put it a little bit in an extreme way, I think we go to a future where everything you like to do, you will not get paid. But all the things that people don't like to do, they will you know, get paid more. Because, you know, I, this is a problem for people like us, right? I'm passionate. I don't care about money. But I'm always in trouble with money, <laughs> right? Because I, I don't pay enough attention to it. So you, every time I get something, it's, oh, right, now I can do my stuff. So I, it's always when I'm in trouble when I have to go back to the market. And, you know, it's, it's a very stressful life that way, right? Uh, <laughs> so a basic income from people like us would be like a dream because then, you know, let's, let's just go for it, you know, and, and a lot more people would do it in, in, if they would have some solution like that. Yeah. I, I, I like, I have a very optimistic, I like really optimism, but, but I want to ask the sort of motivation question. You sort of answered it on the keto example. So there are tasks that aren't intrinsically motivating to practically anybody, right? But the people will do them in the interest of some other thing they believe in, it seems mm -hmm. like. So, but that's not only... So I guess I'd like you to ask sort of the belief in the commons as a, as a model of the world. Because it's not just that, it can't just be propelled by what interests people or what they find intrinsically motivating. It has to be that you believe in this thing because you want to dedicate your time and your, and your talents to it. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I want to come back to what I just said, basically. The, the, uh, the idea that if we create con conditions so that people can follow their passion you know, and give their skills and time to what they really want to do, and then we have a separate system right, for the things that people don't like to do. Because even if you, I mean, I live in three communes, a spiritual one, a political one, and a, sex, a sexual one. And all three broke down because of the, of the dishes. right? So we believed in something, but nobody wanted to do the dishes, right? So I, I, I think the belief in itself is not sufficient. You, you, you need some other mechanism. Uh. <laughs> well, if you could tell, tell us a little more about your work in Ecuador, uh, with what particular communities did you work, what were the results? Okay. Well, I can also maybe talk and then a bit tomorrow, more tomorrow. Tomorrow you can uh, give a full account of your yeah. project on Ecuador. So a bit more briefly. Um, so we were commissioned by three governmental institutions, uh, the Minister of Knowledge, the Secretary of Innovation, and a public university. And well, we, we organized a participatory process with a creator, I love creators, uh, 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 civic and scientific input from inside Ecuador and outside. So we had mechanisms to, you know, to get input for the four. For example, we, we had exchanges with 70 Ecuadorian civic uh, organizations. Um, so first we did like uh, 24 workshops uh, locally in every one per province with mostly you know, like local civic leaders and, and women and young people. And, uh, then we did the formal civic uh, NGO types of organizations. With all this input, we created a synthetic text uh, and we put it online, and there we had like a wiki contribution period. So people could, you know, criticize, change. And finally we had a summit with one-third foreigners, uh, one-third government, and one-third civic. And we had 12 tables, one per subject, where these three groups had to agree on a final uh, version of the legal propositions. We also visited communities like uh, Afro, Afro Ecuadorians, indigenous Ecuadorians, uh, stuff like that. Um, it, so it sounds better in theory than in practice, of course. Uh, there were lots of problems uh, because also the government wasn't popular with everyone. So the fact that we were a government pro sponsored project, you know, uh, closed some doors. Um, but I'll, I, can, I can tell more tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I think it is 5.30, so we should probably wrap up for today. Yes, yeah, sorry for talking too long. And, uh, <laughs>